All right, well, hey, welcome to Code Freedom. This is episode 241, and I'm really excited. I have some great friends of mine on the on the show to, here today. And, you know, we're going to kind of do a tribute to Father's Day because, you know, I feel like a lot of times fathers tend to be attacked, uh, not celebrated a lot, um, you know, as, as normal. And, and I think it's important that this message kind of goes out. And so I have Ken Lindsay out of, out of South Carolina, great friend of mine. Uh, I have Fred Graves out of South Carolina, another great friend of mine. And I have David Quaterbaum out of New York. He's also another great friend and a business partner. And, and you guys have two things in common. One of the reasons why I have you mm -hmm. here is number one, you guys are all God-fearing men, uh, but also you are fathers that I look up to. A matter of fact, I think all of your children are like grown and gone, <laughs> right? So uh, I think there's a lot that everyone can learn from all of you. So uh, definitely excited to have you all on the show. You got some questions and of course you, this is, this is kind of like conversations with dad. That's the title, conversations with dads. And, and so one of the first things I would ask is, you know, how many kids do you have and what are their ages? Just so the audience kind of knows in perspective, you know, what your situation is. I have uh, three daughters. My youngest one is 24. My middle daughter is 26. And my oldest daughter is 31. Awesome, awesome. And, I, and you say you have the three ladies with the three college degrees, huh? <laughs> three ladies with three college degrees, that's right. Awesome, awesome. I have four. Um, my wife and I have two and a half, two prior to being married. Their ages are um, 32, 30, 28, and my youngest is 24. And yes, they are all out the house. And the two oldest I have, they are kids now. So often. Awesome, awesome, good stuff. Um, who else? Uh, we got Fred next. Yep. Yeah, um, Fred Graves here. I have uh, two kids, a daughter and a son. I um, hope my daughter's not going to watch this because she don't like for me to tell her age, but she she's 26 and uh, be celebrating another birthday soon for her. And then my son is 21. Wow, nice, nice. It's so funny because I've known all of you all as kids since they were younger. <laughs> so it's so interesting to see how things kind of go. But um, I'm just curious, when you guys first became fathers, how did it make you feel? Were you nervous? Were you scared? What kind of thoughts did you guys have? I don't remember being scared or nervous. I know I was happy and excited, but um, I was also young. Uh, I think I was 24 when my daughter was born. Um, was we, we were, She and my, uh, her mother and I was, weren't married at the time. We are now, but um, it's this. I just didn't, I wasn't nervous. Um, I didn't really, um, I guess because I really didn't have any expectations. So I was just excited and happy. That's awesome. Sometimes not having expectations is good because you don't get disappointed. You know what I mean? Right, right. So that's a good thing. If I was honest, I would say, uh, I can echo what Fred said. I wasn't, I really wasn't nervous, nervous or scared. But um, I can be honest, I was ignorant to the amount of work that it took. Um, I, was, I was just in love with the idea of being a parent. So, you know, yeah, but yeah, if, if we knew what it really took, <laughs> I think nervousness and scared would have been those words. <laughs> uh, I'll just say um, I might be a little different. I was both nervous and scared. <laughs> I, um, I was nervous because I didn't have... I'm very analytical, so I like to know what's going to happen next and things have to add up. And I didn't know what was going to happen next. Um, so I was nervous. I was scared because I know in raising a child, there's a lot of things you have to be mindful of. And um, I was not sure that I was equipped. Even though I was older, I was uh, I was in my late 20s when my youngest or my oldest daughter was born. Um, but I just knew that it was a responsibility. So I knew I had to step up, in other words. Definitely, definitely. Well, hey, y'all definitely stepped up and y'all made it happen. And so um, I don't know what you all's relationships are with your, your fathers, but how has your relationship um, perspective changed as it relates to now that you are fathers? Like from your father's relationship to you, and then you kind of have, has it shifted at, at all when you had your own kids? I had to take the lessons I learned 
from observing my father because my father wasn't in the house. Uh, I grew up in the southwest side of DC. My father lived on the northwest side, northeast side of DC. So on weekends, I would go spend time with him. And that was the unstable time, you know, hanging out with my dad, going over people's houses, you know, that kind of thing. And when I went home, my mom, me and my brother, it was just him and I, um, was strict. There was a routine, there was expectations. So I had to kind of observe like, what is best for me? for me, what would, what don't I want to do and what I do want to do. So there was some positives and some negatives I got from observing my father. But overall, all the things that happened will work towards the good because it developed what I am and what I've been able to impart in my three ladies, my three daughters. I had to navigate totally different, my perspective. Um, yeah, when I heard the question, it did challenge me. I don't think my perspective of being a good father changed, but my relationship with my dad probably changed my approach because <clears throat> um, I grew up in an abusive home where my father really was very abusive, um, but I realized at an early age that he, his dad wasn't there, so I was able to be uh, have a little compassion and understanding. So what it prepared me, and be honest, you know, my wife can vouch that I had to read a lot of books. I, I had to look at other people. So it changed my approach because I realized that I did not have a lot of the tools. So my perspective was I knew I needed God. And um, my best bet was how can I get enough of God to where I could be the best father that I could be? So uh, my perspective changed on how I approached it and how can I be better prepared for it? I really didn't. I don't remember any challenges with my pops per se. Um, we always had a pretty good relationship. Um, he he was in the home, uh, although he he was he didn't really get he didn't get saved until I was fourteen or fifteen. So uh, the up until then, you know, I, I kind of learned uh, some of the bad traits. And then once he got saved, I saw a different side of it. So um, I guess I can take some of the take some of the things that I learned that I saw him do before he got saved. I used that to not do in my own marriage and and you know with my own children. So um, yes, I, I can't really say we had a, a bad relationship. We always had a good relationship. And of course, now that he's saved, it's it's even better. Awesome. Good stuff. I mean, that's awesome. I mean, different perspectives. Um, I know for me, like um, my father, I know that he didn't have the greatest relationship with his father. So I've learned to give him grace because I know that he didn't necessarily have it modeled. You know what I mean? And, and it's, 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 uh, it's a lot of maturity to, to be able to look past how you feel you were treated um, to say, well, let me figure out how things went for him. You know, because there's got to be a reason, you know what I mean? So I just I just want to ask that question because I know there's somebody out there who doesn't have a relationship with their dad or maybe doesn't have a good relationship and maybe they're trying to figure out how they can navigate on their own as a father as well. My Pat, my bishop mentioned this today um, on today's uh, message. We were blessed enough. I was blessed enough. My brother was blessed enough to have examples. So I had uncles. So... On the in the summers, I would go to Michigan because I had two uncles in Michigan, and I was able to observe. And they were very good fathers, traditional homes, doing well. So I, it was almost like I could see a model of what a what a father looks like in the household. Um, so it's always, you know, God always has a you know a, a ram in the thicket, but He always gives us opportunity to to see what is proper, what is right. And um, we're blessed for that. So even if it's not in the home, there's models around us that we can always glean from. But that's awesome insight. Um, let me ask you guys, what kind of challenges have you guys faced? Maybe one of your biggest challenges that you could think of that, um, and, and maybe how you navigated through it as a father. Because I know there's a lot of fathers out there who are like, man, it's hard, <laughs> you know, or I don't know how to get through this season of my life. And maybe you guys can share some ideas on that. 
one of my biggest challenges uh, still is really is being, I guess, expressing uh, love and uh, sensitivity. My kids, my kids know I love them. They they know it, but I don't because I didn't really get that. And I knew my parents loved me, but because they didn't, we didn't grow up in the house saying, you know, I love you, and we, you know, have conversations all the time and hugged all the time. I just didn't grow up like that. And so now that I have my family, it's really hard for me to do that. Um, it's, it's hard for me to, to, you know, just grab my daughter and hug her. And, and even because of that, she's kind of hard like that now where she don't really, she don't want to be hugged. I know she loves me. She knows, she, she know I love her, but she doesn't want to be hugged and all that stuff because I, I didn't do that to them growing up after they got past a certain age. Um, so that's that's one of my biggest challenges still is expressing uh, my love and uh, just just being sensitive or being that father who who's hugging on them and holding them. Uh, that's my challenge. You know, I'm glad you said that because it just made me think of something because I, I had the same situation. Like I didn't really hear I love you at all from either of my parents. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I, I went to a church in Rochester. Actually, uh, you know him, Mr. Quaterbaum. And uh, you know, the pastor would say, I love you. And I'm like, you don't really know me like that. <laughs> like, it was just like really weird for me, but I liked it, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I just think as men, it's, it's better for us to be more expressive and to be able to share, let people know, because you just never know how, how, how much somebody as a child, especially needs to hear that from their father, I'm proud of you, or I love you or things of that nature. So I'm glad you shared that. Our biggest challenge is, first of all, there was no book, so there was no guidelines, right? And I had three ladies, so I kind of knew how to raise a, a, a boy because I know how my mom raised me and my brother. Like, you had to be tough. You you had to fight because you had to kind of show where you are in the neighborhood, and um, and your name was important. But with girls, it was different. So, and my wife's perspective was different from mine. Like, I had, it was discipline. Like you do it, there's no question. Don't make me say it twice. And my wife was a little bit more, I would say more nurturing, right? But more of a conversation with let's have fun, let's play. And um, so I had to learn. And the fortunate thing is because I had three daughters with the different ages, my first daughter, yeah, I probably made some errors, all in love, but some errors. Whereas I was modeling that dad who was strong, who was the protector, who was, when he walked in the house, all the foolishness went out the house, right? But as I grew and as I learned, and as I learned the word and was in the environment, put my kids in the environment of our church where they were teaching the words and principles and men was expressing their emotions and their feelings, I was like, oh, oops. Okay, we'll get better as we go along. So I think that that is the best a challenge. Um, and it's okay to have those challenges. Now um, that my kids are older, my youngest one is, is back home. Um, after she got her master's degree, she came back home. But my middle daughter is getting married next month. And I said something at church to some of my uh, brothers. And I said, every time we as parents try to take the chapters and go back in the book, our kids make us go forward to new chapters in our book. And I was not ready for this, but God's grace and his, his, the comfort of knowing the word and knowing what he has um, put in me, the, the Holy Spirit in me to guide me has allowed me to kind of be okay with this and, and follow it through and give some good words of wisdom that I didn't read and that I didn't learn from someone else. It was just inspired, and, I, and that's that's a blessing of being not only a father, but having Christ head of your of your life to guide you. So you said something, and I, we're still on that question, but now I kind of got a follow up question because you talked about discipline, and I know in my role, uh, I'm you know I'm raising my nephew, my wife and I, and uh, I know for me personally, and I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but sometimes we kind of get like the the negative side from the, the children because we are the disciplinarians. <laughs> so I, I don't know what's you guys experience on that in terms of like, 
no, I'd, I'd rather talk to, to mom be, or auntie or whoever, because she may say yes, because <laughs> I know what they're going to say. I know what they're going to do, because they're kind of more the structured disciplinarian, like lay the law down. So I'm just curious. We're still on that other question, but what's your perspective on that from being the disciplinarian or the, the person that does that in the home? Me, early on, it was a heartbreak because you did stand alone. Cause I am the, you know, I'm the disciplinary and, and of course my wife can discipline as well, but she were more so the go-to parent. Um, I think for me later on in life, I realized our roles are different. And as long as I'm consistent and understanding and learning my role, then later on your kids will come back and they'll put posts and things out to, to say that they saw you. And here's all the fruits of your labor for being that consistent disciplinary. And I think how we do it. Um, and that was one of my challenges. Um, like Mr. Quarterbaum said, there really was, I had, my father-in-law was one of my first role models or a model of a healthy family and a husband that did it. So I got married in um, 97. So by that time I'm living at, you know, 25 years old and didn't really see a family structure that worked together. The ones that I saw, I seen a lot of other stuff. So until I met them, but um, for me was, that challenge was just changing who I was. Uh, my voice was loud. My wife, you know, everybody wasn't accustomed to that keen voice and, um, and um, learning to be what they needed and listening to calm down and speak with the temperament. Like Mr. Quarterbone, you know, I'm used to hearing, um, go sit down, get popped in the chest, get hit upside the head and parent in a certain way. And um, I think learning to undo some of the things in life that I thought was okay, um, to shift to something different. But consistency and trusting what you're doing, don't, give up because of the they going to mom I, I remember sitting in the house and they all talking to mama and and I come in and like where's my hood you know but over time because I can honestly say I really wasn't where I need to be but once I got where I need to be they understand my role they understand mom's role and I'm very appreciative that they appreciate each other's role now wow good stuff you know, I want to stay with you real quick because this is something everybody can answer this, but I know you particularly, you're really big on being the head of your your household and being mm -hmm. like the priest of your home. So tell tell us, because this is actually a personal question for me. What does that look like if you haven't seen it modeled? You know what I mean? Like, like we all want to, from a God perspective, you know, like how do we how do we lead our homes uh, as a man of God in a way that will is not like overbearing but still mm -hmm. we're, we're able to lead uh mm -hmm. our families man you really you literally almost brought tears to my eyes because i remember that challenge like yesterday um just want to give a snippet d and i got married in 97 um i had just i had two kids prior to us getting married but we got custody of our oldest daughter uh made some decisions that kind of thrust us into some fast rapid growth um, so at that time, I just rededicated my life to the Lord and my wife thinking she married a guy who was pre-Christ, who had the fun side. So dedic rededicating your life back to God's work and to him, um, I came to churchy. I really cut everything out. So I started my first leadership role as a husband as I'm the head, it's my way or the highway. So that strangled my wife, that took her out. She couldn't lead, she couldn't follow under that. So that created the issue. And then I became the passive guy. Whatever you say, cause I'm tired of arguing, I'm tired of fighting, I'm tired of the struggle. The kids, every time you say something, every time you give them something, they got something to say. It's like, whatever you're doing, it's like you're feeding them poison. <laughs> so, um, so it was a struggle. So I said, whatever you say. So I was the laid down leader. Uh, by that time, six, seven, ten years into the marriage, I've been reading a lot of word and allowing God to do the work in me. And I would tell you the, the greatest scripture that I would say to help a man to become 
the head of his home. It was to one, love your wife as Christ, love the church. There's a lot in that. First, the first part alone, we have to know how Christ loved the church. So that's a challenge. Once we learn that, then we can be a better husband. And the second one is Galatians 5.22. When I learn how to be patient, when I learn how to love, when I learn how to walk in peace, when I learn self-control, when I learn how to really trust the voice of God, I didn't have to yell at my wife and say, it. no, we're not doing it. I can say, no, I don't believe we need to do it. And I think a lot of times we as men get pushed to a point to where we have to use the lion voice versus the lamb. And for me, I had to practice walking as a lion with the lion temperament because my oldest, well, I, I had to deal with two young ladies first and I couldn't always roar. And dealing with my wife, she, you know, they really helped me change my temperament and my approach to them because I want them to follow. I never wanted them to be afraid and they were more afraid than willing to follow. And um, I can, and, and um, I learned this from one of the books from John Maxwell, it's a, um, a people person. I was leading by position, I'm the head. But when I learned how to know how they receive instruction, how they communicate, then they gave me permission to be their leader. Man, you said so much right there. I mean, I mean, just think about it. Jesus is the lion and the lamb, you know, but we don't always have to be the lion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's so good. Well, y'all are y'all are giving some major value. So let me ask you guys, why do you think that fathers are so attacked in our society? I think fathers are attacked because I believe that it began in the Garden of Eden. Um when when Eve ate the fruit, nothing happened. When Adam ate the fruit, mankind died. I think Satan saw that. Satan saw that God put the responsibility on the man to 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 replenish the earth, to nurture, and to really be like him, um, and to, to to bring the family to be like him. So from that point, and it's not just the I think I don't think it's just the fathers. I think it's man in general that the attack is against. Um, but but also too more so the father because the father's responsible for um raising his children um raising his wife and covering them and presenting them spotless so um i i think that's the main reason why the, the attack is on the man and the father so much because satan satan knows um how god values us and he knows what we hold inside of us and he's going to try every attempt he can to to kill us um, and to 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 make our family die as well. So um, that's what I think it is because you can look all throughout the Bible where, when um, even in King David's times, when when they were attacked, you know the um, you know the, the the men they wait till the men were gone, then they attack the household. So it, it's it's just Satan, Satan knows you know where the vision comes from. So he like to attack the vision. Wow. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, when you attack the head, you know, the, mm -hmm. the body follows. So anybody exactly. else want to elaborate on that? It is a plot of the enemy. It's strategic, right? Um, because in Genesis, uh, Genesis 1, I believe there's 20, God said, let us make men in our image. Well, what does Satan hate the most? God's image, right? So if he can attack the man and set the man up so he is a weaker vessel versus being the the strong the covering for his family then he can dismise the family and the structure of the family and so uh, it is a plot of the enemy and what's so sneaky about it is that it becomes institutionalized in how the media portrays men how even our own uh, well, women talk about men and it is the underlying theme that if I can break down that man, that very image, then I can make my image greater. And so that, that, is, that is why we have to be careful what we say about each other as brothers and what we allow people to say about men in general. And uh, yeah, it is it is is very very strategic, 
what the enemy is trying to do. Well, you know, as we get ready to close, guys, uh, let me just ask maybe one more question. You know, this we, we have people who are new fathers. We have people who are soon to be fathers. We have people who are longtime fathers and still trying to figure it out. Um, what's one piece of advice, one or two pieces of advice that you give to someone who's wanting to raise their children, especially to be in the faith? I would say, man, um, uh, listen to your kids. Um, love on your kids, encourage your kids. Again, when I was growing up, you know, we, did, we didn't communicate much um, as a family. Uh, uh, we talked, but we, uh, we didn't talk a lot, but we definitely didn't communicate a lot. Um, and it was always when our parents said something, we didn't second guess it. We didn't question it. Um, we didn't ask, we didn't, we didn't say why, you know, we, we, we didn't uh, dig deeper, and, but we can't raise our kids like that. Um, there still has to be a level of respect that the kids need to have for us, but we need to be able to sit with them, talk to them, explain things. And, and the main thing, if, if you're gonna raise your child in a Christian home, don't don't be that weird church person who always saying blaming things on God. God told me to do this. God told me to do that because that will make your kids hate God. Um, uh, just 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 try to listen to the voice of God. Just um, try to use wisdom when you talk to them. Um, like Ken said earlier, you know, learn how your kids receive things. Uh, just just encourage them and listen to them. You know. And, and 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 don't put church first put god first but don't put church first and that's all i have that's strong and let me just piggyback on that because something that i'm learning is um you said listen to your kids i learned that having family meetings is important because this is giving people a your kids and your family a platform to be listened to right exactly because sometimes you can go for months and years and they got something on their heart that they just never share, but they've never really had a platform to share it. So yep. that's just something that I'm learning now and, and really making sure that I implement is having family meetings. So I appreciate you sharing that. Two things. One is I agree with Fred and that is keep God first. Um, the other thing is I would say more, it's important to build a relationship, rapport with your kids because each kid is different. Different personalities, different ways of communicating. So you have to find, sometimes it's not sitting down with a kid. Sometimes it's, it's going, to, going to the store or going swimming. And you'll be surprised when you're in that right element what they're share with you. Or you're in that bus ride, that school bus ride, where you're the parent and the bus, and you see how they interact with their friends. And then now they see that you're a cool dad because the other friends like you. So they didn't, now they start telling you stuff and that builds a rapport. Um, those are things that, that uh, you can't forsake. That's why time is so important. And one of the things that I, the Bible says, raise your kids in the way, way raise your children in the way that we have them to go. And when they grow old, they won't depart from you. So you have to, when I was a kid, we used to read the Bible. My mom used to read the Bible to us. Now, what I did is my kids, has learned the word and the things that we say, but when we get them in the church, they're speaking those same words. It's not coming from us. They're hearing it from the pastor or the youth pastor or the deacons. And it's now, oh, okay. And other kids, not all of them, but some of the other kids are saying the same thing. So they're like, oh, it, okay, it is cool not to go in with the crowd and, and vape and do all this other stuff. It is cool to be set aside, be unique. Um, that's that's very important. So patience, listen, um, but also I think something we got away from. My grandmother said this, and this is the old Southern phrase that I didn't really know what she meant. But she said this, she said, your face will go further than your name could ever, no, she said, your name will go further than your face could ever see. My grandmother had a third grade education from the fields of Alabama. I was like, what philosophy class did she go to? Because I never heard that before. But I learned it. And it meant that when you see that name Quattlebaum, when my kids wear it, when I wear it, it's not going to be trashy. You're going you're gonna to know that that name means something. So I have to carry myself like that name means something. So that's very important for the kids to feel self-empowered, knowing that they are someone and they have a family that means something. 
That's so good. You dropped a lot of nuggets there too. So man, that's powerful. Uh, over to you, Ken. So for me is, I, I've learned to try to be something that I didn't have. And um, like Fred said, um, definitely when they get of age, listen to your kids. They help you to better treat them. Um, no more so than I think my youngest daughter helped me to be a better parent than the majority um, because she was very vocal and I believe I had to deal with myself in her. Um, just like Mr. Quarterbaum, make your name great. Um, the Lord said he'll make your name great, but you do it by disciplining yourselves in the area that they're going to watch. I really try to be a model of God. I, I worked on myself more. So if you work on yourself more, your family, and your kids catch more than what they hear. They see more. Whatever they see is what they, hey, you're like, man, how you did that? You didn't see me do that. I did that years ago. I did that behind the scenes. Yeah, but it will come to light. That's the truth. And um, the spirit tone of your home, the, the father is the spirit tone. He's the overall tone. The male should always be like, okay, how is my presence in my home today? That wife, she's going to cultivate it. And we know how the story goes. Whatever you give her, she multiplies. You come in at a high temperature, she's just going to multiply the heat. And, um, and I've learned those principles. They are true. Um, so when I come in, if I'm consistent, be consistent in being good and being great and doing what is right, um, then your, your child will not depart from what they seen, what you've trained them up, what you told. If all three work together, what you're telling them, your actions, and them able to see it come to fruition, um, stay on that course and you know, you're gonna have challenges, but I think they put you in a better place to succeed. Good stuff, good stuff, man. This is so good. I'm, this is, I'm, I'm being enriched right now. So good stuff. Really um, enjoyed what Mr. Quarterbaum and uh, Ken said. I mean, it, it, it really, uh, they really dropped some nuggets. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, look, I mean, I want us to pray over the fathers. So, um, I don't know, maybe all of us or maybe one of us, it doesn't matter, but um, I just want us to end it with a, a prayer for, for fathers, because I know that they, they're, they're fathers out there who are, who are needing it in a major way. So uh, I'd love for someone to go ahead and maybe do that. Okay, I can start off and then uh, others can uh, join us. For sure. uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your, your love not only your love, but your grace and your tender mercies, Lord. We thank you for having led, uh, spirit-led brothers that are sensitive to your will. Father, we ask that you continue to bless us, to guide us, and, and, and to honor our steps so that our steps are righteous before you. Father, we ask that you anoint the hands, the mind, the feet, of those who carry the responsibilities of being the head of the household, father, the covering of the family. And we realize that we have to have Christ ahead of us so that we can be led and led properly. But we ask for your protection, not just on men, but on the, the women, the wives, the children, the family structure. Lord. Let us be that beacon of light that in darkness, the, the light shines and men will give you the glory. We understand, Lord, it's not by our will, but our might, but through you, we have strength, we have power, we have victory. And we will give you the praise and the honor and the glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, we dropped the mic right there. Good stuff. Well, hey, listen, thank you guys for tuning in once again. And uh, we can't wait to um, be able to bring more value to you guys. God bless and have a great day. Happy Father's Day. <laughs>